We want to continue our study of John, and if you'll turn to chapter 2, we'll be looking at the first miracle that he did, where he turned water into wine. Now, we must remember always that the very purpose of John's gospel account was to produce faith in those people that read it, John 20, 30, and 31. So it is that the apostle recorded various signs that Jesus did. Now, it must be understood that the miracles were not signs within themselves. That is, a sign is never a sign of itself. It always points to something else. And so the miracles were signs that pointed to Christ being who he claimed to be, the only begotten Son of God. Now, John, of course, didn't record all of them, but he recorded enough to produce faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Now, get the setting of this, if you would. We get some insights here of social activities and how those people lived. It was done, that is, this miracle in Cana of Galilee, at a wedding feast. It was on the third day after Jesus made uh, two more disciples that we come into this passage, chapter 2 and verse 1. And it took about two days to go from Judea to Galilee. Cana was about four miles northeast of Nazareth and southwest of the Sea of Galilee. We learn from the first chapter in verse 43 that Jesus had wanted to go to Galilee. And we also learn that uh, one of his apostles, Nathaniel, was from Cana, John chapter 21 and verse 2. I don't know why the mother of Jesus was in attendance at the feast, but she was, chapter 2 and verse 1. And Jesus and his uh, disciples had been invited too, we see in verse 2. I think this establishes what we probably already know, but it gives further credence to the fact that he was not an ascetic, but he was a person who was sociable. The same was true of his disciples, Matthew 9 and verse 14. The scripture simply says, He came eating and drinking, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 19. In contrast to John the baptizer, the forerunner of the Christ, who stayed out in the wilderness. And we would consider him a very strange character as far as his looks and him staying away from people. People went out into the wilderness to hear John preach, but Jesus went throughout the regions where there were people. Now we learn from Jesus' mother that the wine had run out, John 2 and verse 3. She may have been there uh, helping to serve, may have had some responsibility. We don't know. If you look in verse 5, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. But running out of wine would have been an embarrassment at least to the host. So Mary informs Jesus about the matter. I don't know whether... She was hinting to him uh, that he would work a miracle or what. I have no idea about that. John 2, 4, we see Jesus' response to his mother. Now, he addresses her by calling her woman. And nowadays, if a, a young man or a child were to call his mother woman, he'd be trouble usually. But this shows you the difference in the cultural and social Uh, changes from us to them because woman was not considered a rude comment but it was a proper way to address one so it's not a term of disrespect at that time you see such brought out in various places John 19 verse 26 and chapter 20 and verse number 15 so it is the opposite today and this is a good point to make in studying the scriptures that we must understand them as they had to do with that day and time and not bring it over to our view of things in day and time. 
Now, it's interesting that Jesus responds to her by saying, uh, what, what does your concern about this have to do with me? Now, there may be some things about this we don't understand, but maybe this was a mild rebuke of Mary. I don't know. Maybe knowing what she knew about him, he was saying, Here's your, she was saying, here, son, is your opportunity to do something. Uh, I do know that another time, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, when Jesus was in their living room, Martha was so concerned about getting things ready to eat that she asked Mary to leave the teaching of Jesus and come in to help her. And uh, that's when Jesus said, Martha, Martha, uh, Mary has chosen the better part. That is, you don't have Jesus in your living room teaching the Word of God every day. But you can move tables and cook meals on other days. So I think one thing it does establish is that uh, women are pretty domestic in their attitude. And I think any of us men know that if you're inviting people over to the house, it means uh, that the wife is going to be doing everything besides turn it upside down to get it presentable as she thinks it ought to be presentable. And it shows you that's very much in the feminine nature which is not a thing the world wrong with that as such. Um, he says, though, my hour is not yet come. Uh, our Lord's comment suggests that Mary's request may have then been more than just simply to provide a gift of wine. I don't know what all that he meant by that. I know that he's meaning at least this much that I haven't done all that I'm going to do before I will be declared to be the Savior of the world, the Son of God. Don't know how much Mary knew about all of it. We do know that his brethren did not believe him to be the Son of God until after his resurrection. Now, the Lord knows how to order all things. He knows when to do and what to do and how much to do to make it work out. And he knew that what needed to be done here. So it wouldn't be time to really go out and declare him for what he was until after his resurrection and ascension. John 2, 18 through 19 and 12, verses 23 and 27, as well as chapter 17, 1. Christ, here is the great thing to learn, was in charge and knew when to do what and where to do it. I suggest to you as his faithful servants of God, we put our trust in Him on the basis of the Word of God, specifically the New Testament of Christ. And as we adhere to it in our daily activities, Christ will guide us and direct us providentially as we need and as we're ready. Sometimes we see the Apostle Paul when he's converted and became the Apostle Paul, and he immediately began to preach Christ. Yet it took many, many years for the Lord to say, you're now ready to go on the, pri on the primary work or into the primary work that I called you to do. And that is to be the apostle to the Gentiles. A lot of things had to take place. When Paul was converted, the first Gentile convert had not yet been converted. So God was putting things in order. Well, we don't know how God does all that for your individual life, your family, or mine, or anybody else's. But one thing we do know we know what the Word of God says to do to become a Christian, how to live the Christian life, and to worship Him. God will take care of the rest of it. And in this case, Jesus knew exactly what He was going to do and how much He meant in all of this concerning uh, what He said to His mother and what all she may have meant and what she said to Him. I guess we just won't know. But I know that what was the triumph of Christ to be declared on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ as recorded by Luke in Acts 2 is not going to be done here at Cana. This is the beginning, not the ending of His work. So obviously Mary could see that Jesus was willing to do something. I, I think you can see that. So she told the servants, you do whatever He tells you to do, John 2, 5. And this brings us then to what we know as the first miracle that he did. It all began with uh, six empty water pots, verse 6 of chapter 2. 
Now we get a little insight into a home because these were normally involved with the Jewish rituals of purification, Mark 7, 3 through 4. So you'd expect any faithful Jewish family to have these particular rituals of purification around. We learned that each pot was capable of holding 20 to 30 gallons. The King James says two or three firkins, F-I-R-K-I-N-S. And when you look back at the time and check your measurements, that's what it comes down to. So I will say that the Jews in their ritual purification used a lot of water. Jesus instructed that the containers be filled to the brim with water in verse 7. He then told the servant to take a sample of that water to the master of the feast, John 2 and verse 8. I don't know when the water actually turned into wine. I do know that the liquid that he drew out or that they drew out of the containers was the wine by the time the master of the feast partook of it, John 2 and verse number 9. Now, some people have run to this as proof that it's all right to drink beverage alcohol. I've seen them do it forever today, and they'll say that Jesus made alcoholic beverage. You know, I know that Jesus did not violate any precept of the law of Moses. He lived the law flawlessly. He never broke any part of it. And when I turn back to the minor prophet, as we call them, Habakkuk, in chapter 2 and number verse number 15, here's what I find inspiration of the prophet saying. He pronounces a woe upon somebody. And he says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink that puttest the bottle to him, and makest him drunken, also that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Now I said, well, Jesus wouldn't have given alcoholic beverage to anybody to make them drunk. Listen to me. You cannot take one drink of an alcoholic beverage and not be one drink drunk. Now you take a second drink, you're going to be two drinks drunk. Third drink, three drinks drunk, and so on till you've had a pint or you've had whatever. The alcohol in the amount you drink will do to you whatever that alcohol is capable of doing. It begins to put the brain to sleep. And Jesus wouldn't do that. Now we have in our minds a picture of, well, he wasn't drunk, and we may do it like this. He wasn't falling down drunk. He wasn't so drunk that he couldn't stand up. He wasn't slurring his speech. You realize how much alcohol one must drink, and it varies from person to person on their own tolerance before one reaches those stages. I can assure you of this. The Holy Spirit through the prophet is teaching exactly what ought to be. Jesus did not violate the law of Moses, and he didn't break Habakkuk 2 and verse 15. Yet, if he had made alcoholic beverage, it was for the people at the wedding party to drink. Now, what would he have been doing? The fact of the matter is, the Greek word oinos is a very generic term. And if you study it, you'll find out it can mean the juice is pure, as we say, grape juice, all the way to wine that has been uh, had uh, dope even added to it and this kind of stuff. Y'all just get these books are available to look up. Wine. Now, what happens to people nowadays is they think of wine as we think of wine, and it automatically means alcoholic beverage. That's the way we think of it. They read wine in the New Testament, and they think wine then as wine now. Well, the faithful Jew have a bit of a problem when a woe is pronounced against anybody that gives alcoholic drink to his neighbor. So, well, he would have made him to where he's going to cause him to not even know he has his clothes on or not. It starts with one drink. No one will ever become an alcoholic if they never take the first drink. Now, it seems to me that language could not be clearer. 
the Lord made the best grape juice that's ever been on this earth is exactly what the Lord made. And there's no use trying to get around it because he lived the law perfectly. He never violated it. Therefore, he did not violate Habakkuk 2, verse 15. That's not hard reasoning unless we have some reason that we like to drink it ourselves and get a little tipsy, which I think we might be surprised if you have all the stuff that's in the grocery stores and all the liquor store around just... <laughs> Just how many people might like a little snort of something now and then and then go praise the Lord the next day on Sunday. So we look at this and we see that the master of the feast tasted of it. And not knowing where it came from, that's verses 9 through 10, he called the bridegroom, not surprised in other words, told him that he kept the good wine for last. And that wasn't according to normal custom. And this is where, again, they come back and say, see, if they were well drunk, they're so drunk, they can't taste the difference in the best wine, so you give the worst wine last. Well drunk means you've had a lot of it. It doesn't mean that you're alcoholic drunk. There's no way you can get around that unless you want to say, Jesus made them drunk. Anybody want to affirm that? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, who kept the law flawlessly, made people drunk. So I guess that means go thou and do likewise. <laughs> no, it does not. And so it is that once the best was put out normally, or the uh, best put out normally, then once they were all satisfied with it, then they put out that which was not as good. Now you say, well... They must have had a, a bottle down here. They didn't have it like we buy it today, if you buy it. They didn't have it all measured out and so particular about what they had. They had to be particular about what they did with any of it because it wasn't that way. Now, I, if you get into the study about New Testament wine, as it's referred to many times, or Bible wines, then you'll see they had various ways of keeping it from going alcoholic. Be that as it may, anybody that contends that this is proof that Christians can partake of beverage alcohol is going to have to explain to me how it is that Jesus broke the commandment that's in verse 15 of Acts chapter 2, or rather the book of chapter 2. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Anyway, the best was served last, but normally it was served first. It was the beginning of signs there in Galilee, John 4, 54. And in the working of the miracle, it talks about him manifesting his glory in John 1, verse 14. That's one of the ways he did it through miracles. And what was it to do to the disciples? It was to strengthen their faith. When you see that John wrote this book, as are all the other books containing the proof that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is whom he claimed to be, what does it do for you? Does it strengthen your confidence and trust in God and his word and the gospel system? Or is it just an account of something that happened a long time ago and you think of it about like Star Wars or maybe The Hobbit or Middle Earth or something like that? We must realize that into a world that was overflowing with every kind of immorality and alcoholic drink that could be, these proofs caused these folks to change. And they cease the kind of activity that is listed in Galatians 5 where the works of the flesh are listed. Now, how did it do that? Because they thought about the miracles that Jesus did and what that implied about him. And they paid attention to what he says. They took it for what it was, the word of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, it should not be to justify the custom of social drinking that we come to this passage. should not be at all, but it should do for us what it did for the disciples then. 
and cause us to understand further that Christ is who he claimed to be. The miracle of turning water to wine reveals Jesus as one who honors the marriage bond. How does it do so? He was there. He was there celebrating a marriage. When people want to live together without the benefit of the marriage bond, they're contrary to what God wants. One who bestows his marvelous gifts bountifully comes to mind as I see Jesus condoning this marriage feast. And if he does that in the physical realm, in turning the water into wine, how much more so will he do that for us, spiritually speaking? All these things that he did that had a physical benefit, don't you know they're telling us, I'll do the same thing and even more for you spiritually? One whose infinite love is amazing, but it's demonstrated by his omnipotence. Jesus wanted the marriage feast to go off without a hitch. And he had the power to carry out his will in a way that fit their situation and would do what was necessary to prove his deity. And this is the way that he began to show his favor and to show his glory as the Son of God. So when we are studying these things, you ask yourself the question, how is it that the Holy Spirit would cause John to record this one thing? It may not seem like much, but if you had water pots, and somebody told you to just fill it up with water. And then when they drew out of it, you had some of the best tasting drink that there was around that they normally drank at that time, which was grape juice. Would you even be impressed? Well, it was impressive to them. They knew what they had. The servants could testify, we poured water in that to the brim. And nothing else was added to it. And we drew from it, and the fellow who was over the whole feast testified this is the best grape juice we've had. Would that impress you? Well, it was only the beginning miracles. Many, many more things were done. But that's the beginning of where we have our faith strengthened, our confidence and trust and belief in Christ, and thus the gospel of Christ as the power of God to save us. Now, following these events in Cana, we find that Jesus went down to Capernaum, chapter 2 and verse 12. And Capernaum is a city on the northwestern shore of Galilee. It uh, was visited frequently by Jesus. And if you go to the ruins there today, they have excavated down to a synagogue that was there over about 200 or 300 uh, not much is there that would come from Jesus' day except the side of the city. And his brothers and uh, his mother, as well as his disciples, went there. They didn't stay there many days, John 2, 13. We learned they all went in Matthew 13, verse 55. Now, when you look at this, you see that the disciples of Jesus were very impressed, to say the least, at what they were witnessing. Again, I don't think we let the freshness of this hit us like it did those people there. Now remember, the disciples had heard the testimony of John the baptizer as the forerunner of the Christ concerning Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. I must decrease, he must increase. I'm not worthy to tie shoes, so to speak. They had heard all of that. They had borne their own initial testimony as to Jesus and association with him. Now here's the first miracle, which was a sign, and a sign of what? That he's more than a mere man. He was truly whom he claimed to be. What is it to Jesus 
whether he takes a plastic bottle like that and just says, be filled with tomato juice, and there it is. Or whether he says to these oak trees out here, be moved from here to the back. What difference does it make as to the power that he uses? What is it to him? After all, remember what we said, without him was not anything made that was made. And when you read Genesis' account of creation, it says, God said, let there be light. Now we know the executor was the second person of the Godhead. Through him was everything made. So think about all these biological laws, all these zoological laws, all these botanical laws, all laws of nature. Think of all of that and how it all works together. And it was all spoken into existence by Jesus Christ, the executor of the Father's will. So what is it to him to take these water pots full of water and turn it into wine? Nothing. But it is to us. It's a sign to us. No mere mortal can do that. And thus, what does it say to us? Well, it should be what we'll run into in John 3 when Jesus is meeting with Nicodemus. Nicodemus confessed, no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So the miracles of Jesus should accomplish the same confidence and trust in him and his gospel as it did his disciples at that time. Well, that basically is what I wanted to say concerning turning the water into wine. What he did not do and what he did. And yet some people get so balled up in what he did not do to prove a point that has nothing to do with why John selected this that they miss really what the sign's all about and what it's supposed to be really doing for us. So in many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written. That was written, wasn't it? That we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing might have life through his name. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, then we've studied, I think, with about everybody here to know what to do to become a Christian, and most are. But as a child of God, if you've sinned, you need to repent of those sins. If they're private, known only to you and God, then repent of it right now and pray to God for forgiveness. If they're public to where the blood-bought body of Christ has been reproached by your actions, then you humble yourself and confess those sins, having repented of them. And we'll pray with you and for you as you confess them that God will forgive. Whatever you need along those lines are, we urge you to obey the gospel while we stand and sing.